All right, we're live. It is July 12th at 930, Glock 929 AM Pacific. This is John Morales Solutions 8, and this is the Ask Me Anything, where you come, ask me anything, and I fumble through questions. <laughs> um, yeah, we uh, <clears throat> almost didn't happen today. We lost internet connection here in our building. Uh, we're in North Scottsdale. We have this huge building with this big server, <clears throat> server room upstairs, and lost internet connection for like a day and a half, which is, if you're a digital marketer, uh, it means you're unemployed. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was been, a, been an interesting last week here. Um, but, uh, hooked up my little phone with a, as a hotspot to my desktop over here and kept working with one MBPS, which is pretty much non-existent internet. <laughs> um, so hopefully the chat's working. If you're here, uh, could someone do me a favor and do a test chat because like less two times chats decided just to stop working halfway through um <clears throat> hopefully it works uh i am actually gonna ping uh someone here on the uh oh sf hey <laughs> how's it going <laughs> all right sf digital studios all right we just get here. That's perfect. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, yep. I see Uzair. Thank you so much. So, if everybody doesn't know, SF Digital Studios is a gentleman named Uzair. Uh, we recommend we we um, send a lot of business over to uh, Uzair. He's fantastic. As manager, uh, has got a system built in that is just unbelievable he's actually recreated um the way that his that a, a a digital marketer a google ads manager would interpret a campaign and then make adjustments he's like automated that whole thing uh with checks and balances in it so it's just been it's been fantastic to see what was there's build it's 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 amazing um so great job there <laughs> gaden hey uh best channel you're my morning news <laughs> i'm a horrible news anchor <clears throat> um so yes and then uh leandra yes i can see it thank you so much um is there do you have a linkedin to follow effect on let me see if i can beat uzair to it uh uzair's got a youtube channel uh I think I did. I did. I beat you there. <laughs> uh, enter deep. Hey, uh, is it okay? If my ads doesn't show up every time, be it ad preview diagnosis or practical. So what I noticed about <clears throat> ad previewing diagnosis is depending upon your bidding strategy and your goals. So as an example, if you have a bidding strategy that is using, you know, let's say target CPA uh, or something that doesn't show quite often, so any restrictive bidding strategies, you know, target row has target CPA. What you'll find is that when you're looking at ad preview and diagnosis, sometimes you'll need to run that preview diagnosis 10, 15 times. Uh, ad preview and diagnosis is, is good, but it does sometimes mimic a real life situation. And if you're using a restricted bidding strategy, sometimes that restricted bidding strategy stops that preview and diagnosis from running. What I would look at is if you're using a preview diagnosis, run that test sometimes, no joke, 10 to 15 times. Um, and then when you get the one that shows, you'll see exactly what's working, you know, what campaign ad group keyword is is, is working. <clears throat> what you'll also find, though, is that sometimes with that preview diagnosis, um, it just won't want to run. But you're still your campaign is still up and running. Your campaign is still uh, looking at uh, or is still showing good search impression share, good top search impression share. Uh, but what I would look at is depending upon the how often it's not showing or if it's not showing at all, look at other things. Look at your quality score. Look at your keyword. Is it you know below first page bid? Um, make sure that if you're using a preview diagnosis and you can't get it to run, doesn't necessarily mean that everything's fine. Uh, sometimes it does. But what you want to do is look at is your is your bidding strategy too restricted? Is it something that's not showing as often as you want? Maybe you need to go switch over to a manual CPC with enhanced, or maybe you need to go to uh, target impression share, maybe maybe maximize conversions, depending on, upon how good the campaign's running. So at previewing diagnosis, what I found is that 
if you try to run it a few times, uh, you'll get different results, which is so strange. You can run it 10 times, maybe three out of the 10, it actually works. So don't use that preview diagnosis as the be all end all, because it is depending upon your quality score and your bidding strategy a lot. And when I say quality score, I mean like your daily budget, your bids, is your landing page speed fast enough for it to run frequently? Look at your search impression share um, and look at your keyword to see is there any you know below first page bid or low quality score or uh, low volume, et cetera. Um, so just because that preview diagnosis doesn't run, uh, doesn't mean something's wrong, but if it doesn't run, it could mean something's wrong and that's, that's the areas that you're going to want to look at. <clears throat> um, oh, I mean, hello, John, my browser search and DSA campaigns didn't get any purchase after three weeks. Can it still be used to supplement my smart shopping? Yes. Uh, but look at your top, uh, your top conversion path. And then also Alvin, what is your, um, what is your attribution model? The attribution model for your conversion, if it's last click, you might not even see very frequent conversions at all. Um, if it's, if it's getting in smart shopping, look at the top conversion path and see did DSA, um, or search contribute to any transactions. If you are running a brand, sometimes you get a DSA campaign to a brand or a search to a brand or a search to smart shopping. Um, if you're running smart shopping or you're running brand, those two are going to suck up conversions depending upon your attribution model. Also look at DSA and look at your search terms. If search terms look good, but not when you're not achieving the results um, and your attribution model is set to either like linear or first click um, or time decay or anything that kind of splits those conversions or at least gives some attribution to the first click. Um, then there's going to be some different issues. Uh, but if smart shopping is running well and you're using an attribution model that is going to be more favorable to last click, um, then it might they might not really be producing many results. But you know, we usually give it a full 60 to 90 days before we start kind of hacking off uh, campaigns. Unless smart shopping is just rocketing and we can look at the top conversion paths and see like nothing's been attributing to <clears throat> to that additional those additional sales, DSA campaign, search campaign, or just have never shown up the top conversion path at all, then yeah, you could probably pause those. Um, uh, oh, first click for purchase conversion. Yeah, if you're, uh, and then Alvin, look at, uh, and I'm hoping pronouncing your name right, look at the top conversion path. Does it necessarily mean that they didn't, they didn't contribute? It just means that Google couldn't see it. So what's interesting is you might have a first click uh, on a search campaign, but if the user changes devices and IPs, so if they like started at Starbucks and finished at home or vice versa, Google, I, <laughs> when you run first click uh, attribution, your remarketing campaign will sometimes get those conversions. Well, that can't be if you're not running any other channels. And um, so especially if you're targeting only paid traffic on remarketing, I've had have, I've had had some scenarios where uh, my remarketing is targeting only people of a very specific page that is a PPC only page. And those were getting first click attributed or those were getting first click attributed conversions. So it's physically impossible for that to happen. Sometimes Google doesn't see it all, but check those top conversion paths, just see if it's not, if it's not, you know, somewhere in that mix. So if it's not, then yeah, you should be safe to pause those. Uh, Dylan, I allowed for my display campaign to spend the suggested increased budget for a week uh, and spent 10x our plan budget. This got zero conversions, and now we brought it back down to previous budget. It's getting clicks, but spending zero dollars daily. We upped the TCPA to 200 uh, max display bid, and still won't spend anymore. Is this campaign killed? Should we start a new one? Um, and I think Dylan, you're part of our uh, mastermind class, so let's definitely look at this more in detail on Friday, because um, I think that there might be there's something. There's something definitely going wrong. <clears throat> um, I, I can't remember. I'm trying to think if we looked at if there's expansion turned on or not. Um, display, again, display is my least used channel. Um, I don't like display at all. Um, just because it typically has bad placements. But Dylan, before then, check your placements. And under placements, check the box where it says where ad showed and see if those are good quality channels. A lot of times what we may find is that there's like apps, kids games and YouTube channels that are just not relevant, that are more towards the children that just slam, you know, clicks. So let's uh, let's look at this on Friday because I think there could be a placement issue. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> to spend that much money and still have zero performance, not uncommon for display, um, but I think we can probably hone in and a little tighten up 
the the display categories. Um, might have to go switch over to topical rather than possibly DSK or uh, custom audience, whatever whatever you're using at the time. Um, I would say for now, pause it. Just pause it, and then we'll we'll revisit it on Friday if that that works for you. Um, Michael, hey Michael, hey John. Uh, when is it okay to exclude a product in a smart shopping campaign that's overspending? Do I have to wait the 69 days of my entire budget? I have a $340 product with 1,200 clicks, 270 cost spent, and add zero conversions running since June 30th. Um, Michael, what I would look at first is click into that product since June 30th. Uh, so go into the shopping, go to the products, and click on that product, and look at the the campaign trends. If it's still if it's staying high and running high, um, then yes, pause it. If it's gone high and then recently started to reduce, I would keep it on just because it allows it to remarket to a person later if they do navigate to that. But if you look at that product and if it's the impressions and clicks have gone up and then have stayed high, usually that's indicative that Google thinks it can sell it. But if we don't, if we have other products that are selling, then and and we don't want to waste any more money on that one product, and we don't want to sell, we don't have to sell that product, I guess. Then just pause it, and we can always revisit it later uh, when the campaign's in a in a good return estimate and, and and very stable. So if it's spending a lot of money and it's bringing a lot of users to the site, and they're not buying anything else, and they're not coming back directly, not coming back organically, uh, and they're not purchasing other products, then yeah, let's just let's just pause it. Um, Unless you see that it is starting to go down, if it's starting to drastically reduce, then keep it on because that means that if someone clicks on product A, they can navigate over to product B, and product B will be remarketed to them. Uh, that's the only thing that you lose by shutting that campaign off is not being able to remarket that product when someone comes to the website. So um, that's the thing. If, if it's staying high, pause it. If it's already started to reduce, like it's already started to optimize itself, it's already tested itself and found out that it's not going to work, uh, then leave it on. Um, Hernan, hey Hernan. Uh, it's good, John. Hernan, hey. <laughs> Hernan was one of our original three at Shopify's. <laughs> uh, very good to see you again. Uh, Andrew, uh, when we run ad diagnosis, it shows that my search query matches with five keywords in 11 ad groups. Is it okay or should it be optimized matching only one or two keywords? What do you think about maximized conversions? To okay, so this is, in my opinion, I if you're using broad, especially, uh, just with the way that Google is now optimizing for match types, it just kind of ignores whatever you want. Um, broad is like everything, phrase and exact is like closer to what you want. Um, I like to choose an either or scenario. Um, I like to use broad keywords only. If I have a search campaign nowadays, I only want to run one search campaign. Um, to more general, unless it's like a competitive campaign or a brand campaign, then I'll use exacted phrase on those specific items because those really don't have big overlap. But for a general inbound search campaign, I only run one because that one will turn into, if you're running broad, a thousand. If you're running phrase, it'll turn into like 50. So whenever you see that it matches for like five keywords, all this means is that now you have keyword infighting is what I like to call it. So keyword infighting means, you know, I have five things that are going to work but the one that is possibly least relevant the keyword that has the best performance is going to start showing and the other ones that i want are not so i'm getting that anyway i'm getting just one keyword anyway so my opinion is to reduce it down to a very minimal and then expand later so reduce it down to a small short set of keywords and then as you find search terms that are good add those good search terms as broad keywords into the broad campaign same thing with phrasing exact uh, I like to start broad because this way I don't limit my my scalability. If I start broad, I know I can spend up to like two, three, four grand a day. If I start with phrasing exact, I top out at like 300 bucks and then I, I have nowhere to go. I have to restart the process over again. So our SOP is to start with broad. A small amount of broad though, because five broad keywords is like a thousand exact matches. And then it will only match that one keyword. But the good part about matching only one keyword in that preview diagnosis is Google learns faster off that one keyword. Because instead of saying, well, you have five that kind of are all the same and they will all show up and then which one's gonna get the performance? Well, you've taken your performance and diluted it down to 20% because it just gives it to one keyword and then it has another data point for that one keyword. Rather than giving all data points to one keyword, giving one data point to one keyword, another data point to another keyword, and they're just kind of commingling. So if you're matching five, match one. That's a big, big, big optimization. Just because all of those data points will then go down to one keyword, Google will learn what works, what doesn't work, and is able to optimize quicker. 
So reduce it down to as many keywords, a few as keywords as possible, like pause as many as you can. So the ad premium diagnosis is showing up for one, possibly two keywords, and then expand later on from there. You can still expand into phrase exact. That's that's not an issue. I do have phrase exact and brought inside of one, one campaign, but because I know the phrase exact work and my broader still learning and still expanding. So if you match to more than two, start, start pausing the ones that are the most irrelevant first. That's my, my, my opinion. Uh, there, I have a smart shopping, uh, working nicely. Given grow is about 750%. Nice. Uh, some products are over 1200. Shall I peel and stick these in a new smart shopping and pause them in the existing ones? So first, Uzer, um, what you'd want to do is look, go into your analytics, go into conversions on the bottom left-hand corner, go into e-commerce, and then go into product performance, and then use a secondary dimension of Google Ads campaign ID and go back into your Google ads and look at your Google ads campaign ID and look at if your Google ads campaign ID, which is your smart shopping campaign, whatever that is, if those products are saying like, Hey, I have 1200 clicks and 50 sales inside of your analytics. Does that match up? Most of the time? No. What this means is that you're going to look at analytics and say like, wow, Google ads says I sold 50 of them. Analytics says this campaign sold seven of that same product when you overlay the secondary dimension of Google Ads campaign ID and what, if that does happen, and we have some time here, so we can check that out now, that'd be cool and then get back to me. But if that does happen, what that means is that that ad or that product, that ad, I guess I would say, is very popular, brings people to the site that buy that and then also everything else. So, or multiples of that, um, or possibly not even that, and then buy something else. We have an extreme example where we sold 140, 140 of these one product, but it actually in analytics, it shows we sold eight. So we've been keeping everything in one campaign because they, we know that people jump into product A from the ads, then they look at product B, why well, need product B to remarket to them. If you split out those, those campaigns, they don't, those, those people don't jump back and forth that product very well. What, what, what this means is that when they come in campaign A and they look at campaign or the product that's in campaign B, campaign A is still active. So it's like, Hey, do you want that? Do you want that? Proc you came in on that you're no longer interested in, and the item that's placed in their cart that they're interested in is in this campaign that's not remarketing to them because the other campaign is still trying to go after them. So we find that splitting them usually reduces both performances because now you're taking like the the absolute point zero point of conversion and just kind of like removing that and then distracting them with the, with the original ad. So look in analytics, e-commerce, product performance overlay the secondary dimension of Google ads ID and look at that product compared to Google ads product and see, do they match up? If they do, yeah, you can split. If they don't, can't split. Um, what do you think maximize conversions brings low quality leads? I remember you said this one of your videos. So it's not at all of the data points. Um, maximize clicks brings in low quality leads. In my opinion, maximize conversions brings in more leads, just more expensive leads. So maximize clicks brings in low quality leads, maximize conversions sometimes can overspend for leads that you would have gotten with target CPA. Just maybe you get one or two more, or maybe you get more. I mean, I'm just saying it's not, it's not an absolute, it's just trends. Um, and I've been wrong eight out of 10 times. I'm right. Two out of 10 times I'm wrong. So for our campaigns was what I'm trying to say. Um, it's more of a general, general recommendation. Maximize clicks in our opinion for like the hundred or 200 campaigns we've tried it on brings in lower quality leads because it favors lower positions. Now you can use maximize clicks inside of a portfolio bidding strategy that automatically sets a minimal CPC to avoid that. But if you are using maximize clicks, it tries to give you the most amount of clicks within your daily budget. Well, how does it do that? It lowers a bid because if I spend $5 a click on a $10 a day budget, I get two clicks. But if I spend $2, I can get five clicks. I maximize my clicks. I spent less money on my click. I got more clicks. But when you spend, when you drop that CPC, you drop your position. What happens is if you're think about this in just your normal everyday life, add your own human element to it. If you were to hire somebody, or if you're looking for, for someone to work with and you type in best plumber near me, do you skip the first, second, and third and click on the fourth and say, that's my one? 
you always go the first, second, third. I mean, you, you go top down. That's how everyone, everyone works. So for leads, if I can't work with the person in the first position, I can't work with the person in the second position, I can't work with a person in the third position, and I finally get to our ad, which is the fourth position, what are the odds that's like, ah, you're my, you're my company. You know, the reason why I couldn't work with a third is probably the reason why I couldn't work with the fourth. Lower quality leads. I don't have enough money. Everyone else turned me away. Will you turn me away too? I have a really odd project. Everyone else turned me away. Will you turn me away too? All of those things, the reasons why they couldn't work with the first, second, third person, most likely is going to happen on the fourth time. But what happens is when you increase your bids, you get the people that can work, work, work with the first and second person, and that's where you may need to be. So it's interesting paradigm that if you think about it, if I'm found at the bottom of the top, like the third or fourth, or if I'm found at the top of the bottom, which is like the fifth and sixth, what are the odds that I'm just going to scoop up really high quality leads that ignored all the people at the front or, or tried them and for whatever reason, we're just the magical unicorn that can work with these people. So that's how, my, that's how lead quality, in my opinion, is reduced because of positioning. Uh, Hernan, uh, one beginner question. <laughs> do you consider good customizable, or do you consider good customizable ads for moving companies with extensions and phrase words in the titles and descriptions after a few weeks move to a smart campaign? So it's it's interesting, Hernan. Um, the, I don't like smart campaigns, especially for search. Smart campaigns typically <laughs> they naturally gravitate towards brand keywords because Google's a, is an engine that doesn't care about keywords. They all they care about is when this happens, this happens. So every single time I've tested a smart campaign, except for smart shopping, but smart campaigns in general, in um, search in search campaigns, they favor branded keywords, and that's because the branded keywords Google looks at it and says, "Wow, best click through rate, best conversion rate, lowest cost for conversion." most leads and it just navigate and it just gradually it gets more more branded conversions i can't run a smart campaign that way because my other my brand campaign will simply run and then i don't have control over the search campaign so my opinion is i don't usually use smart campaigns with search i never i, I it doesn't it doesn't jive with our, our normal structure but it's if you wanted to try it just on its own and maybe a negative keyword or brand and then just see how it goes you can you can try it but i like to have more control over that uh, especially as, a, as an agency, it's kind of hard to to keep up with client needs if I'm running a smart campaign. Because I'm like, well, we're going to get where we're going to get. So it doesn't really put us in a good position for our clients. Um, but that's just my, my I'm probably the wrong person to ask about smart campaigns just because we don't really run smart campaigns outside of smart shopping. Um, but hopefully that works. But yeah, we definitely use, um, if you're looking at moving companies, use the location insertion. That works really well because location insertion and do city. So what that means is that when you're building your responsive ad, use location insertion because as a title, because it says, you know, moving company in location city. This way, no matter where they're searching, it looks like that that moving company is right there in their city. So look, I have an, uh, a video about this on our YouTube channel using location insertion. But using location insertion and in ads in local and local companies works really, really well because they think, oh, they're right next door. They're in my city. Perfect. Um, and if you have smaller cities, even better, because then they're like, wow, I didn't even realize that someone's prides himself on being in this 3000 person town and, and is running an amazing campaign. So <clears throat> I would say they use location insertion, but smart, smart campaigns for us never really worked on search. Um, where do you typically start with search impression, share bid, uh, start with local campaign with 2000 budget. I know CPC is hard to estimate, but what about percentage? So, uh, Kaden, here's what a uh, little trick for you. I like to use absolute top 100% of the time. And then I set my bid limit and whatever I'm willing to spend. So when you're focusing on impressions and you're focusing on visibility, uh, I like to say, give me the number one position and give me the number one position 100% of the time. I'm only gonna pay five bucks to get there though. And then usually Google comes back and says, great, you were there 31% of the time. Cool, now I know exactly where I can increase my CPC and how to measure what that is gonna get me. Uh, it's gonna allow me to understand if I need more impressions, I know exactly how much more I can bid and that and more I can bid. And that's in your bid strategy reports so on the homepage of Google uh, ads when you're looking at all of your 
when you look at all your campaigns, if you hover over your bidding strategy, it'll actually give you a bid strategy report. And then you click on that and then that'll show you uh, what's been going on with that and why you're not, you know you're not gonna receive 100% of the bids all the time, but you're gonna know a path to get there. Um, I have a list of 1500 kid channels I can send over to John. You're welcome to, oh, Bohan, that'd be awesome. Yeah, you could, uh, we'll send like a, send a, if you wanna just drop it here. I mean, I don't know how to send it out to everyone because this is YouTube and a horrible at like kind of messaging people on YouTube. So, Bohan, if you want to drop it here, that'd be that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, see, Dylan, earliest increase spend on smart campaign. I'm above break even ROAS, but nowhere near three X. Should we wait uh, after forty five or sixty, or, or do it now to get more? No, I would do it now. Um, smart shopping you're gonna find works better with higher budgets. Um, so. It's okay in the beginning to start to increase because when you're starting to increase, you're giving it more ability to remarket to the bigger audience that you're capturing daily. If you think about a $50 per day budget is gonna have two audiences, new and, re and returning, or new and remarketing, and they're both going like this, and then it's gonna plateau. Well, that, might, that plateau at a $50 per day spend may mean that you're not remarketing possibly as much as you could, and you're not capturing maybe as many new users as you could. So if you give them more budgets, like ah, I can I can remarket to the people I need to remarket. Um, so I would say add budget now um, because at higher spends, there's more learning. Higher spends and more learning usually obviously should increase performance. So go ahead and, and increase now, Dylan. Uh, Bohan, um, Yep, you can exclude these channels from your display campaigns. Yep, that's perfect. And you can have a uh, if it's a list, Bohan, you can you can actually just add it in as a placements exclusion list right into your account, and then any campaign you run after that, you just stick that campaign in that placement exclusion list, and you don't have to worry about like adding it individually to each campaign. Um, if I add one new product to the feed before forty five, nope, nope, it's uh, Alvin is just going to add that product. It's going to start to test it. If it is a really, really, really popular product that people really want, but you don't blow its price, just imagine that that could eat up your budget. So worst case is you get a bunch of clicks. It doesn't make any sales, but if you're watching your campaigns closely um, and you add that new product and it you know, starts eating up budget and not selling, especially after a couple weeks, you might just have to turn it off. But yeah, it's, it's not an issue adding a new product. Um, the peak for the product was Saturday. Yesterday, it spent a lot less. Yeah, I would maybe give it a couple more days, Michael. Um, if it if it still decides to, and that's what I figured, if it's still on a downward trend, then just leave it on. Uh, if you see it pop back up, then just, yeah, remove it. Um, but if it pops back up, it might be indicative that people are navigating to it from the other products in the campaigns and might try to sell. But, you know, that's why we usually wait 45 days is like, is it testing? Is it, is it remarketing? Is it testing again? Um, that's usually what we we like to see is sometimes, and I can't tell you how many times all of a sudden it's like flatline, then boom, sales, just immense sales. So that's, and then I always think like, see, if I would have turned this off, I would have missed this. So again, maybe pause it for the short term and then te retest it later. That's okay. Especially if you have other products that are selling and you're spending your full daily budget, then there's no reason to spend any more money on it. Uh, some of our competitive campaign search term cost half of our daily budget or plus and eats up the whole budget some days, which is a couple clicks, but are not converting. Should we negate these search terms or let the campaign figure out? Um, so Dylan, one quick question. Uh, it sounds like those competitors are really expensive. Um, I mean, expensive, really competitive. So you have two paths, either not going after those competitors or spending enough money to see if it's going to work. The reason why I'm saying spending enough money is because really high competitive keywords are high competitive keywords for a reason. They work. So what this means is that if you find a lot of advertisers going after that competitive keyword, they're not doing that. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're not doing that just to have visibility, but it means that they might have a good, good return from that, but they might need to spend one, two, three hundred dollars a day. So when you find high CPCs, you need to throw your hat in the ring that's, you know, a big enough bite of the apple to see is this going to be good. Getting a few clicks per day, you're not going to find anything out about that. You're going to, after like a year and you get, you know, 200 clicks, you're like, okay, it didn't work. So either really increase your spend or, or just pause it. My opinion is competitive campaigns, pause it, especially if that competitor that you're going after is not running ads often. Another thing you can do is uh, if you have your Google ads and your Google analytics 
synced, like if they're if they're um, if they're in a linked account, look at your bounce rate, your pages per session, and your average session duration for that competitive keyword. If they're coming to your site, they're staying and they're visiting multiple pages. Maybe it's indicative to start to add more ad spend. But if your bounce rate's like ninety percent, they they stay six seconds and then they don't visit more than one page, then just remove it. So look at your linked. Um, analytics account inside of your Google ads, pull it in as a column in your keyword level and just see when people Google the keyword, are they staying on my site? Are they doing things? Are they, are they at least at all interested? And if not, then pause it. If they are possibly increase ad spend if you can afford it. Uh, Kaden, what bidding strategy do you use? That's typically SOP. Uh, so it depends for, I like to start with target CPA. Now, I like to start with target CPA because our clients have the budget to start with target CPA. The reason why I like to start with target CPA is because our first SOP is to go broad to test. Um, it also gives you more clicks than phrase and exact because it's cheaper keywords. <laughs> For, uh, broad match is like half as expensive as exact match as an example. So you get twice as much traffic from the same daily budget. And then with target CPA, I have a safety net. If we have a mass amount of traffic that doesn't convert, it stops. If I have a mass amount of traffic that starts to convert, I can then start dropping my CPA goal and get it more in line. So I like target CPA first. Um, we rarely run manual um, unless targets like DSA campaigns sometimes can't start with target CPA or even top impression share or target impression share. So we have to run manual on, D, on, on DSA campaigns. So if I can't run CPA, I'll run manual with enhanced on DSA. Um, I never start with maximized conversions, never start with maximized clicks, never start with uh, target ROAS. Um, smart shopping, I always start without a ROAS goal, at least for 60 days, at least. Um, yeah, I would say target CP is our favorite. That's just because it sets us up for long-term success more often. And if you have three, four, five grand a month to spend, I can get our clients there in a good spendable and good convertible position uh, quicker. Because and then and then I don't have to change bidding strategies and then be like, well, hold on, remember that success we just found? I got rid of it because we changed bidding strategies. So give me another month. I think that's more indicative of being an agency. Clients like to see slow and incremental growth. They don't like to see you know big growth and then fall and then wait and then maybe some growth and then we got to re-strategize. So consistency for us being an agency is really key. You need to see good long-term statistical growth, even if it's slow. Uh, and our clients are willing to lose money the first 90 days uh, while we're figuring this out. So that's why I like target CPA because some, sometimes you get like, well, my clicks blew up and um, by starting with target CPA. Yeah, that, that was, we expect that. We want that to happen. We need to have the mass amount of traffic, high CPCs to know how competitive is this. I need to, if I, if I could find out for our clients first that this is not going to work in day 30, it's a lot better than it's not going to work by day 60. So or, or sorry, about like six months from now. So my goal in the first 90 days is to get to fail or greatly succeed and consistently succeed in those first three months. So we need to spend the money to find out what's gonna happen. If I was an entrepreneur and I was doing it myself, I'd still take the same approach, but if I had a little more restrictive budget, I might start more with, with manual. Um, and then add target CP as soon as I can. This way I don't, you know, accidentally spend $20, $30 per click in the beginning. But again, it's it, it works well. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to mispronounce your name. And so I'm so sorry. Uh, Adwell? Adwell? I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, so can I increase my budget from day 25 to, oh, $25 a day to $300 a day at 100% ROAS? I think it may be better. I think I may get better result this way or will it ruin the campaign i also exclude all cheap products below 30 for better roas my question below is first yeah so uh out of well if you can let me know how long you ran before you instilled that roas goal that's going to tell me a lot um if you started with 100 percent roas goal i would recommend running 100 dollars a day but turning off the roas goal um, if you just instilled a ROAS goal and you're on day 90, then yeah, you're fine. Um, but if you start with a ROAS goal, I usually reset everything. Uh, every client that come in and I look at, Hey, you've had a ROAS goal. <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's directly the reason why they call us. Hey, I can't scale. I put it to a thousand dollars a day. It's not working. Well, you start with a ROAS goal and then each time you turn it off, you saw these good spikes, but they turn it back on and kill the campaign. You need more data, you need more time. So, um, if you started with a ROAS goal, turn it off 
um, and then let us run for hundred dollars a day first and give that at least a month. Uh, see if that helps in, in that performance. But again, it's all. It, let me know if you started with the return on investment goal or how soon you you put that ROAS goal on. Uh, Dylan, yeah, is a standard for using negative search terms still a thousand impressions, a hundred clicks? Is keyword sculpting still a thing? So, keyword sculpting is not a thing for us anymore. Um, keyword sculpting generates even more keyword infighting because the keyword that possibly was having good performance was showing up for a search term that is not exactly relevant to that keyword. But since you've added that search term now as a negative keyword into the campaign that that keyword did not match that search term that you just added, but, but used to get that, uh, used to get those impressions and clicks, you then accidentally killed the campaign. Uh, and that happens way more often than you think. So even with a phrase and exact match, not so much, but it does still happen. So keyword sculpting, unless you're running just pure exact and you know that you're not getting any other searches but those exact, then you can run keyword sculpting. Um, keyword sculpting can be good with exact. Uh, again, what you're going to find though is that if you want to get it to a good scalable position, you're going to tap out on top search impression share very quickly. Your impression share lost by budget will be very small. And then the only way to scale is to pay for a better position, which usually just increases the CPA anyway and drops your ROAS. So you, you got to think about where would I be at the end of my keyword sculpting journey? Limited spend. And if you're okay with that, then you can do it. If not, I don't, I, we don't run keyword sculpting. Our clients need to get up to like the five, 10, 20, 30, 100, 200,000 dollars per month. I can't do that with exact. It just, there's not enough search traffic there or I can, but I, my row is going to be terrible. Um, let's see, should we test broad match and phrase match keywords in different campaigns or is it not required? How do I optimize my campaign in that way? I, it, it's situational. If your phrases are showing up for phrases that are not showing up in your uh, your broad campaign, then yeah, you can absolutely do it. If you find that your broads are showing up in your phrase and your phrase is showing up in your broad, then don't run phrase. Uh, run broad with a better bidding strategy and more budget. Um, as an example, I had three keywords that I spent a thousand bucks a month on and made six grand. And now I'm spending $3,500 a day in a campaign with 14 keywords and getting a 550 ROAS. Um, and those keywords <laughs> are not even related to the search terms. Like, I mean, we have 5% overlap maybe, but the bidding strategy is what we're relying on. So don't necessarily rely on, is this a good keyword? Rely on, do, does this keyword deliver me relevant search terms? And are those converting? Because that's what's going to happen anyway. Use use your bidding strategy more than your keyword strategy, and not because bidding strategy is going to be easier. It will, but you're going to tap out those keywords. But if that keyword maybe is not popular anymore, or a competitor overbids on a keyword, or any other things that happen with that specific keyword, like it's not it's no longer the trend anymore, that whole campaign is now dead. And that's where that's where you're gonna wake up and be like, oh, well, my campaign's just starting to die, and I don't know why. Because you had a big Fortune 100 company bid a thousand dollars a day on one keyword, and now you're out of the game. So now you got to start over. So you have to think about all the reasons why it might be better to run more broad, or just a massive amount of phrase. But you relying on your bidding strategy, because relying on your keyword is very volatile, very very volatile, and very limiting. So my opinion is. You can test broad and phrase, check your, your, um, ad preview diagnosis, make sure they're not both showing up for the same search. Then if you are, you're just, you're, you're limiting yourself. You're, you're giving yourself half the optimization that you need. Um, but if those phrases don't show up in your broad and the broad doesn't show up in the phrase, then yeah, I can run them separately. Just stream as two different, essentially two different campaigns. What you probably find is that when you compare the two from scalability, your broad is going to way outperform your phrase, but it doesn't mean your phrase is not going to perform. Your phrase is just going to, you're going to plateau on your phrase earlier, much earlier. Uh, Bohan, I'll continue adding channels. I'll continue adding channels and keep it up to date for anyone who wants it. Thank you, Bohan. That's awesome. Uh, within 10 days, my cost per lead got increased by a thousand and I didn't make any changes to the ad groups. What could be the reason? The only thing I changed was adding new ad groups and increased budget. 
<coughs> uh, internet, it, I don't uh, let's see. How do you improve the quality? Okay, so internet, I don't exactly know what happened there. Um, if your cost per lead increased 10x in 10 days, has it stayed there, or how many data points do we have? Like if it's you know two leads, then might need to give it more time. But if you increase your budget 500%, then yeah, it uh, sounds like you maxed out your search and pressure share by budget, and now you're just increasing your rank, essentially. So I don't exactly know. There's a lot of other areas. What's your auction insights? Is there anybody else bidding higher than you with auction insights that wasn't 10 days ago? What bidding strategy are you using? Um, that one, Interdeep, I think um, <laughs> it's going to sound like a sales pitch, but it might be better uh, if you want to join the you versus traffic that we have. Um, it allows us to kind of like, you know, check it out in real time together. Uh, and we get to like, kind of go through and find out what happened. I have too many variables that is going to be a little bit difficult for me to kind of interpret what's exactly going on just because there's, you know, 10 other variables that could change my answer. Honestly, I'm so sorry about that. Um, how to improve. Oh, uh, do you ever exact match a keyword, you know, converts, even though you already have it being picked up by broad? No. So I actually just add those keywords as broad and then just add a whole bunch of ad spend. Um, I never, I never exact match a broad keyword. I simply just, uh, if a search, if I'm getting a broad keyword, let's just say shoe, and then my search term is red shoe, I just add red shoe as another broad because that topical category, I want to expand upon that as well. Again, target CPA and high amount of conversions are going to help that uh, because that's going to give me the, and you'll see that, um, I can even show this, uh, Dylan, on my on my Friday call. Let me, I'll go through some broad campaigns and you'll see that what my keyword is and what my search terms are, not even relevant. I have one, you know, one keyword that I start with and that now I have 20. And then let's say you look at the search terms, those 20 are still not matching the new search terms that are coming in, but the campaign scaling, I'm getting good performance. Um, again, it's Google is no longer keyword centric. If you still think about like what keywords do I need? That's it's the wrong type of thinking. It's gonna it's going archaic. Keyword sculpting is dead. Match types dead. Um, it's it's now towards bidding strategy and and ads. Um, way more than keyword. Uh, keywords work at a lower level. They you but you but you end up having to go broad anyway when you're like, well, my search pressure lost by budget is zero. What do I do now? We got to add more keywords. Um, what keywords do I need to use? Don't know. You never tested anything else besides phrase or exact. So again, you hit that plateau and we've hit that plateau so many times, literally hundreds of times that we just stopped doing that now. Um, how do you improve quality score of broad keywords? Uh, do you think DKI uh, works in that case? If not, then what? Um, Interdeep, what's DKI? I'm not exact, I'm not familiar with that one. Let me just do a quick Google search. Oh, dynamic keyword insertion, sorry. <laughs> um, I don't like dynamic keyword insertion, especially if you're running broad, because then it really doesn't make sense. Uh, so not, uh, and then dynamic keyword insertion necessarily, it'll increase your ad relevancy a little bit, but usually what is uh, gonna be improving your quality score is making sure you're spending enough budget per day, spending enough cost per click, make sure your website is fast enough, use uh, page uh, Google PageSpeed Insights, and then also make sure that your uh, keyword that you're bidding on while being found in the ad copy is also found on your web page. So if you follow along that, you should be, should be good to go. And I don't have too much time left, so I'm gonna try to get through as many as I can right here. Um, what to do if leads are not converting into sales? Um, that's a, that sounds like a sales issue. I have no idea. If you generate, if you convert a lead on your website, then you're not turning it into a sales process. That's nothing to do with Google ads, I think, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Uh, let me know if I'm, I'm misunderstand that. So if you're if you're generating conversions in Google Ads but you're not selling them, um, why? What's the what's their objective as to why they don't want to buy from you? Let me know that. Uh, can you set up a page view? Oh, page view conversion mousetrap use like a shopping campaign and then after gather a lot of clicks. Uh, can you set up a page view conversion mousetrap using like a shopping campaign? You can set up a YouTube campaign with conversions using that conversion that you gathered and no audience. Uh, I heart 3D printing. I'm not exactly sure. Um, we don't use page view conversions just because you teach Google. This is the audience that you need to go after. And those audience audiences are not usually converters. Those are people that might be looking for more information, really top of funnel. 
And then if you want to start to actually generate cash out of the campaign, you got to like then switch to bottom of the funnel, which kind of removes that audience anyway. So I'm not exactly sure. I think you're, you're talking about like using a micro conversion in order for it to learn better. Um, I'm trying to figure out what, what that is. A page view conversion mousetrap using like a shopping campaign. And then after you gather a lot of clicks. Uh, machine learning. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't ever do that. Um, I've done that a few times and then it just ends up stalling the campaign afterwards. Because what happens is top of the funnel is easy. I mean, you can set up a page view conversion on display. Um, so you have a conversion behind a page. <sighs> okay. I got I got I'm not exactly sure. You can set up a YouTube campaign with conversions. Oh, 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 okay. So no, um, behind a click. Yeah, so no, my, it tends to take months, I mean, months and years for Google to really define a really well audience for you. I haven't found any kind of quick tips and hacks that are successful. Lead magnets, sometimes even lead magnets to conversions aren't even really that successful. Even add the carts uh, to conversions are really not that successful. Um, for for using that as a as a conversion, whatever you tell Google a conversion took place, that is the most important thing you've ever done in that entire account. So much so that if you do that wrong, you have to get rid of the account, not campaign, the account, and then start over. So if you mess that up, you have to completely delete that account and then start brand new from scratch. So I don't ever do that just because if you're wrong and those people that showed interest aren't actually the people that convert, you have to wipe that account, start brand new. and for our clients, we can't do that. Um, we can't just delete their account because their account probably has five years of history that they come to us and say, don't screw this up. And so I can't do that. So no, we don't ever use those. Um, let's see. Is it wise to increase target CPA on campaigns that are not spending entire daily budget? For example, our search, yes. Uh, yeah, and the only reason why it's not spending is because it doesn't know where to find those conversions yet. Um, definitely increase target CPA. Just know that your cost per click and your daily ad spend is going to go up as it buys that data. Um, it's only spending about half to two thirds of the daily budget. So increased TCPA from 20 to 200. Uh, now it's spending again. Is this reckless? No, just know that right now you basically have it running wide open. That's all it means. Spending a $200 target CPA just means that this thing is just going to run completely wide open. And then as those conversions come in, you're then allowing yourself to then reduce the target CPA in order to get a more in goal. So just know that that's what's happening and be prepared to start to reduce the target CPA so that your, um, your, campaign is going to get smarter. Uh, I think it was missed. Oh, for, oh, I'm sorry, Michael, for smart shopping, is it more about time or money spent before making any changes? Time, for sure. If you, if you're getting a lot of good data points, a lot of clicks, a lot of impressions, a lot of conversions, um, the more time you give it, well, I guess there's an X and Y axis. You can give a lot more money, it takes short time, but if you give a lot of money in a long time, you're even better. Um, so time and money is equally important, but time is a lot more important because the, uh, the pat, the days to conversion and then Michael, if you can remind me this, I'll show you this on Friday. I have campaigns that after day 60 and day 90, the biggest amount of amount of revenue comes in. So it's like, Hey, half of our purchases came after day one, but then the other half, the majority of the other half actually came between day 60 and day 90. So more time teaches a lot more So make sure you're also tracking your, your conversion to click through conversion up to day 90. But I would say time is more important than money, but you can shorten that time and get more data with more money. But if you only had a set budget, the longer that you run years, way better it's going to be. I have a campaign right now that has a 2000 ROAS on $60 a day because we're in our third year and it just runs. We increased yeah, by like 193% last year. It's insane. But without without adding a dollar in budget. Um, thank you, John. And cost of that and help us. I hope you have more customers and subscribers. Yep, definitely. Thank you, Aaron. We're having our best. Every month is our biggest month ever. We're up to like 44 employees now. It's just, it's insane. We're just, yeah, it's, it's very humbling. So all you guys here make it possible. So thank you. Uh, Daniel, hey, John, I was wondering if you are using any anti-spam click protecting service that ClickSees or BBC Protect. We use ClickSees. Um, well, sorry, we used ClickSees. We found that some campaigns that help, some campaigns are hurt. Google has a whole wing dedicated to uh, removing click fraud and then refunding in real time. So I find that I don't use them as much uh, unless there's like, oh, yeah, definitely click fraud here that Google's not catching. And then I'll use it. But I don't start it, uh, start with a campaign with it. I just add it on when appropriate. 
Um, what tip do you have for campaigns to target betters? We don't want to use their name and ad, of course, in landing page. So quality score and pressure is low. Any audience ideas? So no, if for competitive campaigns, if you don't want to use their name in the ad and you can't have the name on your web page, you're going to have to pay to play. Your quality score is going to be junk. You have to use manual and you have to overbid. That's just the way it goes to competitive campaigns. And that's why competitive campaigns, you need to test the water. Like when we were talking about earlier, you're getting $4 cost per click, not you, but like a first gentleman here was getting $4 cost per click, I think it was Dylan. Um, and now you need to put a bunch of money in there. Google's gonna say, well, I'm not gonna give you this keyword, you have a quality score. It's like, well, what if I give you $10? Google's like, well, okay, I'll give it to you. So you have to pay to play for competitive campaigns. One good way to not necessarily upset anybody and not, not piss off the world is if you wanted to do like a comparison, like you versus your competitors. So this way you can bid on your competitor's name, you put in your ad copy, you can build a page and make sure you don't just bash them, but just show how you're different. That's okay, you do that. Um, thank you, John, for giving your time. I appreciate your welcome, Mr. Deep. Uh, behind a click, oh, uh, oh, well, thank you. Okay, cool, yep, uh, yeah, that's the iHeart 3D printing. Again, very, very dangerous because that account is gonna learn that conversion. So just know that if you're like, hey, these people are interested and we're converting to a good cost for conversion, it's like throw all the money there. And then, and then you're like, well, I tried to remarket to them and they never came back and bought. Now what do I do? And then you gotta just wipe everything. Be like, what about the people that are ready to buy now? And then that's where you start. Think bottom up, go to the people who are ready to buy now, then work your way up, work yourself up the funnel. Don't start at the top of the funnel and figure out the way. It's very expensive, takes a long time, but get all the money that you can now from people that wanna buy and then figure out, well, why do they wanna buy? What were they looking at before? Or what are they looking at else? Or what else can I share with them? So start from bottom, go up. Don't start from the top and go down. Much more expensive and longer. Uh, thanks, John Kelly again. You're welcome, Dylan. Uh, Derek, I got like one minute left. How? Or let's see. I'm gonna try to get through as many as we can. So, yeah, I'm gonna try to get these questions here. Uh, it's ending with high hard 3D printing. Says thank you again. Um, I'm gonna get through as many as I can right here. So how to optimize for smart shopping campaigns for more conversions? Spend as much money as you possibly can for 90 days. Don't use a return on ad spend goal at all, and leave it go. Don't touch anything. Give it time to learn. Things are going to do this. They're just going to be all sorts of crazy. Um, let it go. It needs to learn what does sell and what does not sell. It's going to be half the time right, half the time wrong. But if you start interrupting its process, you're just going to have to do it all over again. So as much money as you can afford to lose for 90 days, don't use a rose gold the entire time. And if you need to, shut only shut off products that are overspending and you know will never make a seller. That's usually the best way to do it. Uh, one last question on, do you know any tool for client reports for paid ads? Uh, any tool for campaign optimization or should I, I don't use any tools for campaign optimization at all because what I know about a company and about their needs, about their goals, about their sales process, about their company's you know, long-term growth, no automation is gonna do that. Um, the reporting tool, use Google Data Studio. Links right up with Google Ads shows a really nice live link to a report that's customizable and query by date. Use Google Data Studio, that's what we like. Is it okay to segment smart shopping campaigns? I have a group of products, I have a target, a particular car niche and I have separated them in different, uh, no, not necessarily, Adewale, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Watch the recording again if you can. What I told SF uh, Studios was there is if you have a product that is getting clicks and then they end up and go and buy something else. Again, even if it's not the same niche, it doesn't mean it's not happening. But compare and go back and watch that. Compare what your Google Ads says, what your Google Analytics say. If if your Google Ads matches your Google Analytics, yes. If your Google Ads data, sales data don't match your Google Analytics, no. So good rule of thumb there. Um, thank you for your email, John. Really learned, oh, thank you very much, Alvin. Uh, yeah, we did it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Oh, all right, fine. I'll do one more. Uh, what do you think about putting a non bounce visit as a conversion or three plus? Um, no, I've never, I've literally never had any, any success with that. I've had to try to work through those from inheriting campaigns from clients to say here. And I'm like, just, we're going to delete the account, start over. Never, ever, ever have I ever been able to take a campaign that has been optimizing for not a bottom of the funnel conversion and then turn it into a bottom of the funnel conversion. Doesn't happen. Um, so I've never had, I'm not saying it can't, I've never been able to do it. Uh, the hundreds of camp or probably thousands of campaigns now that I've been running, never been able to do it. So I can't ever recommend it. Not to say that someone hasn't already done it and been successful. I have not. If we take it for what's worth. Um, all right. 
Oh, uh, don't, don't, ah, stop here. I got a call in like three minutes I got to get prepared for, so let's just do it real quick. How can I track conversions for affiliate links? Uh, I have a three-step funnel that provides an affiliate link as a third step. You most likely can. Um, the only way to do it is if that affiliate link, place it in your tracking template, it still might not work. But so here, do this. Your final URL, go to the page that they're going to go for. Your affiliate link uses a tracking, uh, tracking template. Just stick it right in your tracking template or in your final URL suffix. It most likely what's going to happen is just going to get lost after, after the first uh, first click and it's not going to travel through. But if the website is tracking cookies, try it just adding it in your tracking template. Let me know. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm out.